All right, hello everybody and welcome to NiceGate 2022. Uh, for those of you that I've not met before, my name is Rob Strajewski. I am the Director of Instructional Technology at the Oakfield, Alabama Central School District, which is between Buffalo and Rochester. So we're nestled right between there. Um, today we're gonna talk about ClassLink. Uh, I've done this presentation a couple of times at NiceGate, um, at Brainstorm conferences, and um, also at ISTE, a couple different places around the country. So I am gonna bring you the most updated slides I have because ClassLink is always changing. There's more connections to add, uh, more vendors that they work with, so I have the, the most recent slides to show you today. Um, I'm recording this session. This will be available possibly here on my website, so I wanna make sure you guys know about this. This is where you can grab the slideshow that I'll be using today which is located right there um, the old link is robztraining.com that's probably easier to type but the new one is techniquesworthsharing.com either way both of those are going to get you to, the, to my blog and in there you will find the nice gate conference and the section right at the bottom there is the google slides that i'll be using today Second to show you is uh, the district, as I mentioned, that I work for, Oakfield, Alabama. We are oahornets.org, and I've been there now for eight years um, as the instructional technology uh, director. Prior to that, I was a classroom teacher um, for Amherst Middle School for 14 years. I taught seventh and eighth grade technology education, so robotics, uh, structural engineering, green screen video production, all the fun stuff that kids really like to do. Um, I miss that, but I kind of like my new role as being a, a technology director because now I'm reaching kind of a wider audience with Chromebooks and ViewSonic panels and ClassLink and ParentSquare and all these great tools that we have now available to us. And another thing I've been doing for the past 10 years, I teach as an online adjunct professor here in the on, uh, graduate program at Canisius College in the Instructional Technologies and Curriculum Design Program. So if you or anyone you know, this is my little sales pitch here, is looking to obtain either a master's degree, totally online, or even as little as a four course certificate, an advanced certificate, um, Canisius has that. And we have, most of our students are from within New York State, but we have students from outside as well. Um, all the classes are on eight week sessions instead of the traditional 14. So you can do the uh, program in about half the time of a traditional program. So that's Canisius College, and that takes us to the slides for today. All right, so starting off, let me go full screen here. And feel free to stop me at any time if you guys have questions along the way, anything in context. We can, uh, we can address them as we go. All right, <clears throat> so if you've not heard of what ClassLink is, I myself knew of the name, and I knew of their competitor, Clever. Has anybody used Clever before? All right, Clever is where many of us, including myself, kind of start because of the price tag. Clever is free. The reason why it's free is all the profits that Clever makes is not off the school district. It's not off of us. It's off of the vendors that you're working with, which also means then you as the employee end up being the, the, doing the grunt work. You reach out to the vendors, you do this, you do that, you do that, and that's why it's free. However, flip the coin, ClassLink, you pay for ClassLink. It's a couple dollars per student per year, and it's well worth it, as you'll see in my presentation today. They have a whole team of people on staff 24-7 that will answer your questions, get your rostering working, uh, get your uh, parent portal up and running. Uh, you, you start buying, you know, I buy IXL. I want to create a, an icon for my kids to use. They'll do that for you. In other words, they do all the work which is why it's a paid product because they, they have lots of employees on staff to do that. So this slide I'd like to start with because it kind of gives you a heads up view of where most people start, which is on the left hand side here for students and staff doing the single sign on. The whole concept of whether you have, like in our district we have Chromebooks, maybe you have iPads, maybe you have Windows desktops, maybe you have MacBooks, whatever you have, they have a solution so that you have a portal with a bunch of icons like the screen shows here. And those are all not just simple bookmarks, but they contain credentials in them so the students and teachers can just click on a button and take them directly to the resource log them in without having to type in a username and a password especially for the younger kids the typing of passwords and stuff as we know can be problematic so this is just look for the icon click on it and you're in so I'll have some screenshots of our launchpad coming up in a little bit um, nowadays multi-factor authentication is heard a lot anybody hearing about that, especially in, in my role as a tech director uh, for cybersecurity insurance. The companies want to know, are you doing MFA? What kind of MFA? Well, with ClassLink, you can do MFA to get into the ClassLink portal, kind of as, as the, the hierarchy overall umbrella. But then each individual icon, each individual resource, that itself could have MFA. So if you need it for, say, school tool, but you don't need it for parent square, you have the, ch the choice to uh, either use or not use MFA for any of them in there. And again, you can do that for students only, 
staff only, everybody, just tech coaches. You know, you can totally uh, customize how MFA works. So that's been relatively within the past year or two, a newer thing within ClassLink that I'm just starting to dabble with, but I can see the advantage of having it because it's not an all or, or one situation. It's very customizable. Bottom left corner here, analytics. This is huge for someone like me that has to spend uh, six figures annually on software renewals. Do we renew uh, IXL or BrainPop or um, iReady? You know, that's, some of them are $20,000 we're paying for one thing. Should we do that or should we reduce it down? Uh, the choices to make that spend the money really are made by using the analytics dashboard. We'll have some screenshots in here to show you guys because you can see, show me how many people have used IXL in the past month. Show me how many from last year to this year. Show me how many in the sixth grade building versus the ninth grade building. You can customize that and it's all captured because of simply people clicking to launch it from the launch pad. Now you may be thinking, because I did too, what if people aren't using a launch pad? What if instead they use bookmarks like in the Chrome bookmarks bar up top? How are you going to capture those clicks to know that people are, are or are not using a resource? Now they have Analytics Plus. All right, and that's one of the only things that ClassLink will charge you extra for because everything is, is an all-for-one price. But Analytics Plus, I literally think it's less than a dollar a student. It's, it's a very small amount of money. Well worth it. For my whole district, it's like 200 bucks a year. It makes sure that all clicks are counted, even if they're done outside of the ClassLink uh, portal of the launch pad. So now I truly can figure out who's going to that resource, whether they are or are not using the ClassLink launch pad. Before in the past, we kind of told everyone, we told the teachers, make sure you're telling your kids to use the launch pad because if you don't, next year you might not have uh, that tool because we, we didn't renew it because it looked like nobody was using it. Um, but they say, hey, everybody is using it. We just bookmarked it. So the ClassLink uh, Analytics Plus has been a great addition as well. Moving over now to the right-hand side, the OneSync server and the roster server. I actually have ours cloud-hosted, so I don't have to host them on-site, but I believe the majority of ClassLink customers have them on campus, uh, so their data is controlled by them um, locally, but you can do either or. Uh, the OneSync server has to do with um, provisioning accounts such as Azure, Microsoft Office 365, and for us, Google, um, Active Directory, so that in, as employees and students come and go, that is the automation that the as they call it the auto magic just happens an account gets provisioned within 24 hours when they leave an account gets deprovisioned within 24 hours so i'll have some uh, case studies here to show you in, in terms of that the roster server has to do with sending your data to all the different places you use and i mentioned brain pop i mentioned iReady those are common places that we use so that i don't have to create a new iReady account because a kid just got enrolled it happens automatically so we'll look at the roster server as well and then on more of the public side, the bottom right corner, the parent portal and the public portal. Those are ways, because of EdLaw2D here in New York State, we have to let our communities know what tools are we using and um, have they been EdLaw2D approved or not. And that is a great way to showcase it for your community so that they know and you check that box of compliance for New York State Ed too, that you have a parent portal and a public portal. So before we move on to the next slide here, any questions about that high level overview of the multiple pieces. All right, and as I mentioned, the great piece of it is, I wish I had someone from ClassLink here because I usually I, I lean in them for the money part of it all. Um, I'm not exactly sure what the cost is, but I know it's usually a couple dollars per student. It depends on the overall size of your district if you're small, medium, or large. But it is a all, I like to say an all you can eat buffet. You pay one price, most people just start with the launch pad, and then maybe six months later, I wanna do rostering. And then six months later, I wanna do the OneSync server. You can build as you go. You don't have to then come up with the money to, to you know, add the different pieces. And as they create new pieces, um, with the exception of Analytics Plus, which is less than a dollar a student, um, they just throw that in. It's just part of the package deal. So every year when you renew, it's an all-encompassing price. So for me, in a small district with a small budget, that helps because I know that I'm not going to be left behind when they come up with something really cool and neat that I want to do. It's already part of the package deal. So a lot of this I covered on the last slide there, but just to show you in a different view, single sign-on and access really is their uh, bread and butter where they started uh, many decades ago, um, and that's having that one portal for teaching and learning. Um, there's a lot of things such as uh, Active Directory password resets that can happen via portal remote because you might want to keep that Google password and the Active Directory password in sync and keep them the same way. ClassLink gives you tools to help that process happen. Um, we talked about multi-factor, uh, account provisioning, secure rostering, 
there's the analytics and analytics plus so I'm going to jump forward to the next slide here and talk about signing in so you have many ways to sign in to ClassLink um, in my particular district we're a very heavy Google district so we just simply you'll see in a moment here one button on the sign in uh, page that says Google just the button click sign in with Google and you're in but if you're a Microsoft district if you have other tools you want to use for the younger kids you could have those quick cards which are little you know QR looking code things that they can wear on their uh, you know a lot of kids have them that they wear and they can hold that up to the webcam and use that to sign them in um, without having to type anything in they typically say go only go up to second grade and beyond second grade now we have kids learn about typing usernames and passwords but quick cards for the uh, pre-k k1 and 2 can be very helpful they do have facial recognition and they do have a remote login because there is a class link authenticator app you can put on a phone more for the adults you know teachers and administrators uh, but all the plethora of ways to log into to class link uh, this just keeps on growing every time I see this slide there's more icons on there Yes. Yep. So you, you use one sync. You yes. Can, I'm assuming you use one sync. Yeah. We have a dummy. Yeah, we're getting ready to go that way. Okay. If you do one sync, is the logging in with Google, is it connected automatically already? In other words, our kindergarten, first and second grade teachers go through and log the students manually into class. They make the connection with Google. They make the connection. So they get some quick sign with Google and move forward. Okay. But if it's if all this is rostered with one sync, wouldn't those two be connected? They would be, yes. Are you guys on Chromebooks? Chromebooks, yeah. Okay, so you can go even one step further and make that Chromebook login be a ClassLink login. You have to put those Chromebooks in their separate OU, so they're kind of designated just for those grade levels. And then because you're signing into the Chromebook with ClassLink, you're already signed into ClassLink, so there's not an extra step to and do. That's because you use OneSync or that's available even with, because we're not OneSync yet. I was always intrigued by that. Uh, that's a good question. OneSync is in charge of making the accounts. Yeah. If you have already made them, then I don't see why that wouldn't work. Because Google would know who you are because your account is provisioned. Yeah. Yep. So moving on next, here's our launch pad. It's just one button. In fact, what I did a little more than one button up top, if you see that green icon there, we had to, for EdLaw 2D compliance and Board of Ed compliance, we had to make sure that all users can see our acceptable use policy, both for the staff side and the student side. So since I figured I'm popping up the screen on every Chromebook when they log in, it's guaranteed to be in front of their eyeballs, at least at the top I have. By using district owned technologies, you agree to abide by the district acceptable use policy. That's a clickable button right there, and they allow you to do this in ClassLink. It's a great place to capture um, eyeballs and get something in front of people. So they can click that, and it'll take them to our acceptable use policy. So back in the olden days when we were on Windows machines, um, before the user signed in on Windows, we did have a you know acceptable use policy, blah blah blah, there for them. This now is like the modern day version of that, and this way I can guarantee it happens across all devices because all of our staff and students they need to use the launch pad, so they have to come here on whatever device they have, whatever platform they're on, and that way we make sure that we cover that. But the main button, of course, is right there. You just click sign in with Google. It knows your credentials already because you're on that Chrome device, and it takes you right in. So this may look overwhelming. To me it does when I see it at first. This is our classic view of the launch pad. Notice all of those icons. Many of them are things we pay for as a district. And I have to say, when I started teaching or being an administrator at Oakfield eight years ago, one of the first questions was is teachers saying, what do we still have? What do we pay for? What can I use that I don't know we have? And before the launch pad, I didn't really have a good way of saying, like, these are all the things we pay for. So this took care of that because now teachers can see, oh, well, it says Pear Deck, I guess we pay for that. And it says Ginzi, we must pay for that. So it gives the teachers kind of the heads up on the tools that they don't yet use that they could use because they're seeing them on the launch pad. And I'll only put the icon for them if it applies to them. For example, Ginzi is an interactive whiteboarding tool. We only use that in the elementary building. So only uh, pre-K through 5 is going to see that. Middle and high people, they're not going to see that because I didn't push that out to them. So I can selectively choose where these icons go on people's launch pads. Individuals can put their own icons on if they want. You can have that set up so they're allowed to. I tend to not do that unless it's adults. I let the adults put the icons on. Kids, I don't because I feel like they would go nuts with putting icons everywhere. Um, but we do take requests. You know, if someone says, hey, I'm starting to use uh, abc.com. Uh, They'll ask me to put it on the icon, uh, the icon on the launch pad. That's my chance as the data protection officer to say, wait a minute, we don't pay for that. I have to get a you know signed contract for that or not. So for this whole EdLaw 2D piece, this helps with that because now um, people are still coming to me 
and asking me to put stuff on, and that's where I can do that double check to see if we have the, uh, the data sharing agreement. At the bottom, I wanted to point out too, there are some uh, bookmarks, if you will. Those are kind of the common ones that people are using a lot. And it's real easy to right click any one of these and say, send to my favorites. And the favorites shows up at the bottom. I see students doing that when I just casually walk by and look at their screens. I look at the bottom and I see, oh, those are the ones I use a lot. Like elementary kids use Quaver for music. Um, I notice that's down there. Maybe the teachers are telling them to do that. Maybe the kids are doing that. But it's kind of nice that they do have a level of customization. However, not so customized that they don't have stuff. I can guarantee that they all have Quaver because that's a locked icon. Where it is in the lunch pad, it's up to them, but I can guarantee that the correct users have it because it's locked there. Another view they came up with, class they came up with what they call the primary view, mostly for elementary school. They made the icons bigger, especially if they are using fingers on touch screens to you know, select instead of a mouse pointer. Um, so a lot less bells and whistles on the primary view. Um, and then they also have a third one, which I don't have a screenshot for, but they call the professional view. That one is loaded with, I think, more than is needed. It has a left thing. It has a bottom tray. It has bar. It just has so much on the screen. It's kind of uh, you know overwhelming for the initial user. So in my recommendations, I tell people the classic view really still is the classic view for you know the best of both worlds. So those are the views of the launch pad. Now how to get there. I mentioned I want to make sure that our uh, users at Oakfield are never going to say, well, what's the launch pad and how do I get there? Because I put it in their face in many different ways. So first off is from the district website. We always tell people, if you can't find something from a school district, go to the school district website because likely that's where it's going to be. So we do have an icon there, it looks like that, that says launch pad. That's helpful for kids if they're, say, at their grandma's house and that's not a school-owned computer and they need to find the launch pad, they just know go to the district website. Everybody knows how to get to oahornets.org so they can find it there. Next up is the Manage Bookmark. So in Chrome, I don't know if you realize this or not, but as a district, you can push out a Manage Bookmark folder or individual bookmarks. So I have one that's called OA Staff and OA Student, and that launch pad is in there. So we tell them, go look on your, your, uh, your uh, bookmarks bar. Another thing you can do as an admin with uh, using Chromebooks is you can set the browser homepage. That little home button that you click in the browser up in the you know address bar area, you can force that to be whatever you want it to be. So we have made ours to be our specific class link. Uh, link. Notice ours is very simple. It's it's everybody has my.classlink.com slash something. That something will be whatever you choose. For us, we just simply picked OA and it was available, so that that became ours force loaded tab at boot up so when the student logs into a Chromebook automatically a tab gets opened and it's that link for the launch pad so that's right in your face right when you log in and then for $12 a year I, I like to buy my domains on google.com has anybody ever bought a domain name you can do GoDaddy there's all these different sites you can buy them for uh, Google themselves has their own service called domains.google.com and any website you want to register I've done it for my children's names I've done it for my blog for whatever it's basically ten to twelve dollars a year so I bought oalaunchpad.org use that and it takes you to the launchpad as well so five different ways for our people to get there makes it hard to uh, you know to say oh I didn't know we had a launchpad it's it's always available to you that way all right, so as I mentioned, overwhelming, right? Lots of different icons there. If you're looking for something specific, they're not really alphabetical. So if I'm looking for Scratch Junior, I can't just go to the bottom of the list and look for S. I know it's kind of a yellow icon, and rather than search for it like that, what I like to tell people to do is use that search bar. Up at the top, in this case I was searching for Parent Square, you could just start typing P-A-R-E and as you start typing it out you get less and less icons on the screen until eventually you're left with just that one. This is especially helpful too if your students or teachers are throwing icons in folders. They can do that, you can make folders, put your icons in there, but then you get the person saying, I don't see it, I don't have that icon. Well, you do, but you put it in a folder, and you may have done that you know, months ago or years ago, so you forgot about it. If they search it up top, that gets around that. It'll find whatever, even if it's inside of a folder. Here's that right-click menu when you click on any of your icons, and there's that Add to Favorites that I mentioned. You can do that, and then it'll add it nicely at the bottom row for you. A nice way to put them there. And now, the different icons you see on these, uh, on these tools. So when there's a key icon, that means it's a rostered um, application. In other words, your username and your password are stored internally 
unbeknownst even to you, you might in some, some cases kids don't even know what their credentials are, and that's fine. It w works almost like a password locker that way. So that way it is uh, rostered, and it's, as we say, better than a bookmark because it holds credentials. The other symbol you might see is the padlock icon, and that means it can't be deleted by the staff or student. They can't right-click on it and choose delete. It's guaranteed to stay there at all times, and I recommend that you do that for things that you pay for. We pay, I think, over $22,000 a year for iReady, so that's a big one. We want to make sure nobody is uh, forgetting about, so we lock it so that it's always going to be guaranteed to be there um, on the launch pad. So ClassLink has an ever-growing list of apps you can roster, and I can't even, even if I took the list from last night when I was updating my slides, it would still be inaccurate because they're always adding more. At one point when we started, it was 5,000. Now it might be 11,000 or 16,000. It's just a growing list because they are kind of the industry leader when it comes to rostering in the K-12 world, and now even higher ed as well, too. Uh, but there's just the beginning of the alphabetical list. What I would tend to do is, if we were looking to buy a resource, I would go to this area and I would type it in. So if we bought Achieve Math, I would go and search for it and see if it exists. If it doesn't exist, I'd reach out to ClassLink, to their help desk, uh, help desk at ClassLink.com, and I would ask them, uh, do you guys currently work with this vendor? Are you planning to work on the, with this vendor? They will give you the feedback of like, yeah, we've been you know, in contact with them. They're on our beta list. Or they'll say, no, we haven't. Uh, please give us your contact, uh, your, you know, your vendor contact that you work with, and we'll do the legwork to get set up with them. And I've done that a number of times, and that's great because it takes me out of the loop. They have their internal team that's working on that. Uh, Patrick is the lead guy of, of that. I think he actually lives in Rochester, so he might be in the, in the classic area, in the booth area. Um, but Patrick and his crew will work with the vendor and say, Oakfield, Alabama is buying this resource. They want to make sure they can roster. Let's do the back-end work to make that happen. Um, sometimes it takes weeks. Sometimes it takes months. But I can say I've never had a point where we couldn't roster if they weren't on this list. It's just a matter of time before the vendor realizes it's not just Rob Z asking for it, but it's potentially more people in New York State or outside that are too. So this is a newer slide that I've had put in here about multi-factor authentication. So three, and, and depending on my audience here today, some of you guys are very familiar with how MFA works, but the password is something you know. That's, you know, monkey123 is my password. That's not too secure because that could get out there. Something you have would be something you have in your possession, such as I have this phone and nobody else is going to have this phone. So as a result, I can use things like Google Authenticator, um, YubiKeys, things like that. In fact, a quick little story. In our school district, we've had some teachers that don't want to use their phone for MFA because they say the school district is not paying for this phone. Therefore, I shouldn't have to use this phone to do my job of being a teacher or an administrator. So our plan B for that is we give them a little uh, YubiKey, a little USB key. They're about $20, $30, and they use that. I would say all but one that I've had to give the MFA key out to, they've switched and said, you know what, it's just easier to use my phone. I know I said originally I wasn't going to, I'm just going to use this now. Because literally they carry this thing around with them. They might not carry that little YubiKey around with them unless it's on their keychain. And not everyone even carries their keys in the, in the classroom. So I would say that, you know, have that conversation with, sometimes it's a union conversation with use, uh, district use of a personal cell phone, but have that backup as an option. That worked for us, and um, I'm hearing other districts, same kind of, kind of boat that they've been in for that. And then something that goes to, to the highest level is something that you are, which would be your face, like uh, Apple has and, and Android phones have facial recognition, uh, biometric fingerprint, things like that that would be the highest level. So MFA, uh, ClassLink is participating in all three types here. And I think on one of my, yeah, on this slide here, it's going to show you the different methods that they use. So if you want to know about the, the lowest level, something you know on ClassLink is the, the challenger response. Uh, having a six-digit pin, it's a quick way to get in as well. Or for the younger kids, just selecting the correct image. And maybe there's a, a combination of both, such as choose your teacher's name and choose your logo. You know, there's it's a very low level, very low level security, but it makes it work for the, the you know, five, six, seven year olds to do that. Um, notice though it's not available for users with elevated permissions like myself, the, the tech director or uh, a building principal. So the something you have and something you are, these are the other tools that they have and notice they are available across the board for all three levels of accounts. So that's, I thought, a nice slide that shows all the different multi-factor, as of now, November 2022, that's what they have. I'm sure in a couple of months or years, there's going to be even more as this uh, evolves all the time. 
So I made mention of Classlink Analytics Plus. That's the one and only thing that you would pay extra for if you want it. And again, I, I know it's less than a dollar user. It might have even been like 60 cents per user. So the reason why Classlink tells me they have to do that is there is a whole lot of bandwidth used, a whole lot of data capture. When you're taking every kid, every user, every adult and kid, every click they make in the browser 24-7 and capturing that. That's a, Think about how many clicks that is. That's a lot of, of bandwidth being used. So to capture all that and house all that data, they have a, just an extra data charge for that. Small district like me, not a big deal, but a district that has you know 30,000 kids, that's, that's a lot of data. So um, that's the only one thing you'd pay extra for. Screenshot here shows you how over the, in this case, they're showing different months of the school year of how a resource is being used. Um, you can put in the amount of money you pay for the resource, such as, you know, that 22000 I mentioned we pay for iReady. Maybe that equates to $300 per user. You could put that figure in, and then that will do some calculations to show you cost per user. If only 20 people are using it versus 300 people are using it, that'll actually show you in dollars or cents. And your administrators um, in the district office, in the budget office, really do like that because now you can have that kind of advocacy piece to show we really need this because look how many people are using it. Whereas let's save money and drop the usage on this tool because not that many people are using it. So you can kind of shift those things around. And, and for me, really, November, December, January is the time frame where we're talking about this stuff because we're planning our budgets for next year. And Analytics Plus helps us to decide how to spend that software uh, renewal money. So Classlink Analytics, how does it work? If it's on a school-owned device, it works on or off a school network. If it's on a personal device, it only works if it's on the school network. So the caveat here being that analytics does not really work if it's on a personal device that's not on the school network. So that would be um, you know, someone's own device at home or on a cellular network if they're not capturing that data. But if we know they're on the school network and or on a school device, that data is being captured. Um, I think this slide is merely meant to show you guys the difference between having Analytics Plus. If you have it, you're going to capture it, um, yeah, because it's July 2021. You're going to capture it outside of Classlink, whereas opposed to through the Classlink, it'll be across the board on the, on the uh, launch pad. That number I know has changed. The last time I had this slide, uh, which was two years ago, it was 6,000. But the single sign-on is always increasing. And to build a, new ex uh, build a new connector, as they call it, it does not cost any extra money. I think with Clever it does. And that may be the reason why I put this slide in here. When we were Clever customers, if we wanted to add one on, we realized it would cost us or the vendor money to do that. With this, the work is done on the Classlink side, not costing the district extra money. So now let's talk specifically about roster server. You have your student information system. In my district, it's school tool. You said in yours, it's eSchool, e infinite, infinite Campus, uh, infinite. and Infinite Campus. OK, so everybody has different student information systems. Classlink works with the, the majority of them, I would say. I haven't really come across in one of these presentations one that someone says because usually I have a classic person here to tell a yes or no for each one. They cover the large ones because whether it's done through um, an API, which thankfully ours is, it's all in real time, it could be done through CSV files if need be, through nightly uploads, uh, uh, you know, once every 24 hours type of thing. So the student information system really is the main source of what's pulling into the roster server. But you might also have your HR system. In our case, now we switched from Envisions to, uh, no, actually we have Envisions now. We switched from another one. Um, to this. So whatever you, I think you said you, WinCap was when you have, so whatever your payroll system is, that could be tied as well. Some of them, again, do work and some do not, so that's where Classlink is going to be able to give you that guidance of if it will or not. One roster is another Classlink tool. We're going to get to that in a little bit. Um, or custom. Custom could be, and I had a conversation with one of the gentlemen here, that custom could be something like a spreadsheet. You could have a Google Sheet where you maintain all the columns the way you need them to be, and you onboard and offboard people from that Google Sheet. And therefore, that Google Sheet is what's staying in, in uh, sync here with the roster server. Um, I was looking possibly to do that until we made the decision to go ahead and pull all adult staff members, both instructional and non-instructional, pull them into our student information system. So for us, school tool contains the database for all adults and all kids in the district. Not everybody wants to do that. Some people are uncomfortable with putting, say, a bus driver or a mechanic, putting them into the student information system. There's ways to control what information they have access to. 
In our case, I know the bus driver is not going to have access to uh, students and parents because they don't have a way to log into it. They're in the system, but they can't log into it. So very specific uh, case in my mind here, but really that's what ClassLink's all about. They're going to assign you a case manager and a whole team of people for onboarding where they will walk you through all the different pieces. You know, what do you use for this? What do you use for that? Would you prefer a spreadsheet? Would you prefer this? And for us, that probably was like a three-month period where we went back and forth on all the different ways we could set it up. And I'm happy now to say four years later what we settled on because really now just it's automated. I'm a I'm a two-person department, essentially. There's two of us in our 800-student uh, district. So we are a small rural district. But by having these things set up and being automated, I'm not spending time creating and, and deprovisioning accounts anymore thanks to how roster server works. And one server as well. Or one sync, rather. So the question that usually comes up is, what about apps that are not on that list? can we save passwords and never need to type them in again? So I myself, for years, have been before ClassLink, I have been using LastPass. Does anybody else use a password manager? All right, so password managers are a great tool to use, but I'm an adult in the technology world for many decades. I know the ins and outs of it. Throw that onto a less tech-savvy teacher or a kid, and a password manager becomes very difficult for them about save the new version, the old version, which one, how do I create, how do I propagate, there's a lot to know. So by using ClassLink as your password manager, as your password locker as they call it, students or even the teacher, in my case a lot of the elementary school teachers, type this in for the kid. They can type in the fields that you see here and save it. So now ClassLink acts as your password manager. All right, and here's how you would do it. You would right click on that icon and choose edit password. Quite simply, you'd put in the credentials, and now from that point forward, it's a password locker that has it saved. All right, so logging into those apps, many different ways to do it. As I mentioned before, we are a Google school, so that sign in with Google button tends to be what we use majority of the time. But there are some apps that we can't use the sign in with Google because the vendor doesn't participate with that. They participate in LTI, or they do SAML or OAuth. These are a lot of, and again, we're getting kind of in the weeds here with a lot of the technical uh, terms, but all the different ways that vendors use to have their users log in, this is just a snapshot of what ClassLink supports. They're always adding on to this list as well, uh, but the common ones that many of you see here, uh, many of them you see are being used by tech directors uh, right now across the country. So we talked about one roster. Now we talk about the other big tool that they do, which is called OneSync. The OneSync server is all about propagating and deprovisioning those user accounts. Active Directory, how many have Active Directory? Okay, how many have Office 365 or Azure? And how many are using Google? Okay, so we have a mix of people in the room. You can use one or many of them. Again, it's all one fee. You're not paying extra for it because literally there are teams at ClassLink that deal with just Active Directory and deal with just Google. So you'll deal with those teams if you decide to go on the road and use those different tools. Um, kind of the bubble off of it here is if you're a Google school, you also can use it to propagate your Google Classrooms. So all of our Google Classrooms, uh, no teacher or myself has to create those. They're created by ClassLink for us by being in sync with our student information system. So the principals do what they always have done. They make those master schedules in school tool, and that's it. Then that flows over to the ClassLink tools, and ClassLink will provision all the different Google Classrooms. And as kids are enrolled and unenrolled, it removes them and adds them to Google Classrooms as well. So teachers will find within a day that kid that just showed up in their class a day ago, oh, now they're in, in the roster. Or the kid that left, now they're removed from there in Google Classroom. That's really nice because then that's a lot less uh, user management that the teachers have to do or that I would have had to do years ago. So that handles that. Same concept if you're using Teams uh, with uh, Microsoft products that will provision and deprovision students in and out of different Teams groups that you have as well. Um, and a little asterisk here if you're using, where did I put this here? If you're using Google Classroom or Teams, you need to have the ClassLink roster server. That server, as I mentioned, we like to do ours cloud hosted, and that's done through uh, Amazon AWS. It's an extra $500 per year to have that done outside, and I prefer to do that so that I'm not having to maintain that server. But if you want to host it internally yourself uh, on an actual server or a, a virtual server, you can. So that's the OneSync server, kind of high level of what it can do. 
Oh, and I should mention the green bubbles on the side. So again, just like we looked at for the roster server, this one can pull from various data sources as well. That Google Sheet is a great one to use too, because there are sometimes, I'm gonna talk about the physical therapists and the occupational therapists. In our district, they're not hired by our district. They are contracted. So that means they're not likely in our payroll system because we're not paying them directly. So I can't pull them from there. And if they're not in our student information system, they don't exist there either. So they have to exist someplace. And for me, that someplace is simply a Google Sheet with just a couple columns. And I know if I put them in that Google Sheet, within a couple of hours, they will be magically synced over. And now within one sync, they'll be getting a Google account. It'll take care of that provisioning for them. So that's kind of my catch-all place to put those users um, if I have no other place to, to, to place them. So the magic of one sync, our dream scenario, this is when we were architecting, if you will, the, the uh, getting started with, with ClassLink. We wanted Google and or Active Directory accounts to get populated automatically. We want them to be put in the correct OU structure by grade level, so I don't have to choose second grader versus 12th grader, that's just automatic. I wanna uh, apply them to the applicable email groups. So within Google, we have a, for example, class of 2023, that's the seniors this year. Uh, class of 2035, I think that's our pre-K kids. So it automatically will throw them into those email groups without me having to subscribe them to them. Uh, the child gains, or, or adult, gains access to our launch pad. And they are simultaneously rostered for all the stuff we use, such as that short little list, but there's plenty more beyond that. So that was our dream scenario to have happen. And ClassLink gives us that uh, capability. But more importantly, what I have down here in, in yellow, because I am also... A, in a small district, I wear the hat of the data protection officer. I have to make sure that our data is not just there when the person's not there anymore. The kid graduated or transferred to another school or the teacher took a job elsewhere. Those are orphaned accounts that we have to make sure are accounted for. Um, not just because the auditors say so, but because for data protection reasons, we need to make sure of that. So all the stuff in, in yellow right here happen automatically when we simply uncheck the box to make them no longer active in our, in our uh, student information system. And I may have a screenshot yep, that shows you the process of how that looks here at Oakfield. All right, so for me, I've decided to set it up for students um, so that I get notified through our student information system. So here's just a little screenshot from my Gmail inbox showing me that a new student has been added to school tool. You know, perhaps a uh, new family moved into the district. I then will go into that um, area in our student information system, and I want, I want a little bit of manual control here. I don't want an account to get provisioned automatically unless I have some oversight. And usually the reason why is there may be a kid that is, say, uh, James Smith II or James Smith Jr. Do I want to put the 2 in there or the JR for junior in the email address? I may or may not want to do that. Or some kids now have hyphenated last names and they're really long usernames. And I don't want you know a five-year-old to have to type all those characters in. So what I tend to do is I will manually type in the desired email address right there, and it always ends in at oahornets.org. So that gives me the chance to decide, should I abbreviate the first name? Should I use the, you know, the hyphenation or whatnot? Um, it gives me a little bit of manual control. And during the course of the school year, I would say maybe two, three, four, five kids a month we're talking. So it's not a, a task that's unattainable. I can take care of that because it's a low number. So I'll manually type in their email address. And the eye color field, which and I've actually, since I made this screenshot, I've automated that piece. Our friends at BOCES were able to make that number pop up there. So I'm using the eye color field as really the password field because I needed our teachers, especially of elementary school teachers, to log into that Chromebook as the kid. And the teacher needs to know what that kid's password is. So I figured if the teacher already has access to the kid in the student information system, We've given some security clearance there because they can look up, you know, parents' names, parents' email addresses, parents' phone numbers. I might as well reveal in that place the password. So I've kind of commandeered a field, the eye color field, and I put in the last four digits of their eight-character password there. So a teacher knows if I got to look up Johnny Smith, I could just find him in school tool where I normally go, look in that eye color field, and I know those four numbers there are actually the last four characters of his password. 
We use the same first four characters, by the way. It's the school district, uh, you know, four letters. But then the last four are, are different. So it's almost like each kid has a, a four-digit pin, if you will, for their passwords. If for some reason I need to change a password because little Johnny told little Susie their password and now they're logging in and they see each other and we're finding, you know, bad things happening, I just simply go and change the password in Google and I make the update here. So the teacher knows you always take the most updated version, go here in school tool, and you'll see the current password. The hope is that kids can keep that password for the whole 12 years or 13 years that they're with us. But if we have to change them, we can. So what happens when the overnight sync happens, it creates their account. But I might be doing this at, say, 9 a.m., and I don't want to wait a whole day for the kid to be able to log in because the kid's sitting in class now. So I can go over to ClassLink. I can log into my roster server, and I can just simply press the button that says Import Using the School Tool API. And within about 30 seconds, that child is now in school in ClassLink, which means all the magic happens from there. Their accounts get created, they get rostered out to all different tools, and that all happens within minutes, I would say. So considerations now on the staff side. When you're dealing with the adult staff, if you're not putting them in the student information system, where are you putting them? Most likely they're in the payroll system already, but as we mentioned, a Google Sheet is a great um, alternative place to put them as well. Consider instructional versus non-instructional staff. For me, I know the instructional staff has access to the kids, but the non-instructional staff, I don't want them having access to look up phone numbers and look up passwords and stuff for kids. So we, we have a way within school tool that allows us to not let them log in, which I uh, alluded to earlier. And staff do need different OUs and groups. Sometimes I have to, after the overnight sync takes place, I have to remind myself to go in and, let's say it's a substitute teacher, I have to make sure that substitute teacher has access to the mailing group we call substitutes, uh, whereas a regular classroom teacher wouldn't. So there are some caveats there where the day after I go in and I just double check things. So I tend to use the, the snooze feature in Gmail. Does anybody know about the snooze feature? I do that just to remind myself I bring that message back to life again you know, the next morning so I can go in and look at it. So that's my way of just making sure I keep that on my radar uh, as I snooze Gmail messages that way. So you have complete control when it comes to creating, as I mentioned, email groups. We have a group called Oakfield Staff, which is every adult on the payroll, and I make sure that's enabled. So any user coming in gets put into that group. Um, grad year groups, this is the specific one where that second grader gets put into class of 2031 versus the senior who is class of 2031. Two, three. Um, that gets put in automatically. So it's kind of neat how you can build these rules so that you can filter based on information that you have where to put them into certain groups or create a certain password. And by the way, I don't do it, but if you wanted to, let ClassLink be in charge of creating passwords. You could do that, especially if you have a lot of students that you're dealing with. Let ClassLink take care of that stuff even for you. You would have to know, you'd have to find a way of knowing what it created, and I believe you can do that through, um, through looking at the logs or through getting email notifications when it says a user has been created. So other things ClassLink can do, uh, I kind of covered this already in the first slide, but the things that you probably, after you've been a ClassLink user for a while, then you start looking at the parent portal, you start looking at the public portal. Um, we are still in the process of setting ours up, so I don't really have any screenshots to show of that yet. But those are things you can do. MFA should be on this list because that's something you could then start looking at. Um, in New York State specifically, that's why I show this slide here, the DPO workflow. So ClassLink knew that Ed Law 2D was coming down the pike a couple years ago. So even though they work in all 50 states, they specifically had a team from New York State to get this um, data protection officer workflow created. So in a district that's a little bit larger than mine, where you might have multiple people involved, say the principal has to approve, then the tech director has to approve, then the business officer has to approve. If there's a workflow involved, you can customize who, which is first, second, third, and so forth. Um, emails get sent automatically asking the next person to review something and then approve it. And then they can simply click one button to approve and it moves on to the next person. So I imagine this is very similar to how DocuSign works. Anybody use DocuSign? or We use, it, we use DocuSign to get um, special ed signatures on documents. So this reminds me of that. It's very similar to it. So you can build that workflow so that you know, it knows who to follow next, you know, uh, uh, kind of up the chain of command, if you will. And so that is relatively new in the past two years. 
Another thing you could take advantage of is all of your files. How many of you have network shares, local network shares, like the S drive or the X drive or the H drive? All right. If you have that, you can find, and you can, this is a great image because it shows you on the left here, you'll have access wherever you are to all of those in one place. So if you have a file in Google Drive and you want to move it to Dropbox or move it to Office 365 or move it to that shared H drive on your network, you can do that through this interface. It really is a great way, especially when it comes to searching, because when you're searching, you're not just searching Google Drive, you're searching all of your tools combined together. This is just a short list of four things, but there are more services you can add to it as well, such as box.com is another one I know of. Um, but you know, third-party cloud-hosted tools as well as local network resources all in one place so your users truly can have access to it. This became really important for districts when they were in remote learning, when teachers were off-site and they needed access to their local network stuff. They had access to it if you set this up. And again, you can choose to do it or not. In our district, we haven't, but it does not cost you any more money to go down that road and enable that with ClassLink. So the ClassLink Analytics, they like to show this because it is available as a mobile app on Android and iOS. So it's really nice to, you know, while you're watching the Bills game, sitting on the couch, go through your ClassLink Analytics and see how many people send in last week compared to the week before. It's a, If you're a person that likes data and to look at that, it really does a great job condensing that for you, not only by app, but by logins, by time of day, any of that kind of data you would want to know about how people are using the ClassLink Launchpad and various tools within. Um, so that is, uh, again, a web-based version for a full browser or a mobile app version as well. For your OneSync server that you might decide to have, again, ours is cloud-hosted. We pay extra for that, but you can host it locally on a traditional server or a virtual server. Um, you have just some of the highlights here. I think we cover most of this, so I don't have to really spend too much time on that. But you can be dealing with the Google side and the Microsoft side simultaneously. Um, uh, Classing likes me to show this one because this has to do with uh, industry standards. They do participate in IMS Global, so it's not just a ClassLink standard, but a uh, standard among many different vendors, um, especially some of the big ones here from textbook publishers, showing you that it is an open data standard that they participate in. It started in 2015, so it's you know in the seventh, eighth year now, and they are um, making sure that when ClassLink develops something, it's part of the open standard. It's not something that's proprietary just for ClassLink. The parent portal is that place where, let's say, parents put money on this kid's uh, cafeteria account. The parent might log in to your student information system. The parent might log in for forms and uh, things to complete uh, for permission slips. You could create a launch pad intended for parents, because we all have the launch pad for our, our adult staff and our kids, but you could do a third one for parents so that they have their own version of a launch pad just for parents if you want to. So that exists. Um, unlimited sources, they don't limit how many things you could do. The big one really is the, the cafeteria automation so that you don't have to remember your password to log in to put money on your kid's uh, school lunch account. Um, and then accommodate source data with and without email and phone notification. Because some parents won't give out their email address or their mobile phone number, they can use this without having to have either or. So it's not forcing them to give that data if they're unwilling to. Uh, here's our little digital on day one. We kind of covered this. The, the flow all goes where traditional is the red tools on the side. We all have an SIS. We all have a payroll system. So now that data can flow over to OneSync. That flows over to the launch pad, and then it flows over to vendors. You have control of that flow, and this is a nice little graphic that shows that uh, process. So the suggestion for rolling out ClassLink is to start simple. Figure out what would make sense for you. In my case, that launch pad was what we what got us hooked. We got us to even talk to ClassLink about you know becoming a customer. For you, it might be provisioning accounts. Uh, for some people, it might be that student uh, cards to log in to devices. Everybody has kind of their first thing they want to get off the bat rolling, and that's a great place to start. By doing that, I would say you're going to really understand the dedication that ClassLink has gone to people behind the scenes. They, uh, they're located, I've talked to people in Texas, uh, Florida, a lot are in New Jersey, some are in New York State. They're scattered all around the country and they have a lot of employees to help you with the different pieces of ClassLink. So for example, a couple months ago when I was having some trouble with Google Classroom, it wasn't 
titling the Telugu classrooms in a nice way, a teacher would see like Math 315, Math 314, Math 313. And she's like, which one is period one? Which one's period two? I thought there's got to be a better way to title those so that the teachers automatically know which is which. And so I worked with their team, and within minutes I had it figured out, and I thought it was going to take a little bit more work than that. But, you know, you get surprised. You're like, oh, I guess it's not that bad. And if I can't figure it out, they'll do it behind the scenes and let you know when it's all set. And it's like, wow, I, I didn't get that with Clever. You know, you, you have to do the work yourself. But they were willing to take on, you know, tasks like that and create that. Because they know when they're doing it, they're not just helping you. They're helping the other districts that they support too. So I guess it's, it's best for them firsthand to, to do it. This third bullet point is a big one. Don't try to do it all. Today I showed you the, the wide menu of stuff you can do. If you start out saying, I want to do one roster, one sink, parent portal, the login cards, it becomes quite overwhelming because, as you know, as a tech director, there, there's a million things on your plate to do. So it, they like to set out a timeline for you. So you could say, you know, three months from now, six months, a year from now, and two years from now to help you kind of uh, gauge what to do with it. So we're going to kind of finish off these last couple slides here with some security pieces. I wanted you to see that all the audits that they have as far as verify and trust. You might recognize some of these things such as FERPA, COPA, GDPR compliance. They are compliant with it. Of course, they are in New York State, Ed Law 2D compliant. They will sign that uh, data sharing contract with your district or with BOCES if you buy through that way. And then they constantly have third-party audits is listed at the bottom there to make sure that they are doing what they say they are doing and every time they have passed those audits. So when it comes to security and privacy, I would rank them up towards that top of the list of all the vendors that we work with for those uh, concerns. ADA compliance as well because we have to be as well with that. They have all the different pieces that make it ADA compliant. And that takes us to the end, where now if you guys have any questions, anything I maybe haven't covered or you want to hear a little bit more of, uh, we can address. Does anybody have any questions? I, I, mind a little more detail. I use, I use roster server quite a bit. And okay. Then, uh, you know, we've got some situations where we've got some uh, teacher assistants or some of the support personnel not necessarily in our SIS okay. as a co-teacher. Uh, you know, teacher records. Yep. So one of the workarounds I tried was to manually add them as the user in, in the roster. Yep. And you can do that. Yes. There's a, a section the where you do that. The problem is, yep. what it does is it takes that class that came from your assess and it makes that teacher a, a co-teacher okay. for every app that you roster. You can't just say, I want them to be a co-teacher for just this you know, ELA-related app because they're supporting up the ELA, not for math, not for anything else. Yeah. They get all enough. Have you ever dealt with that one? I haven't heard that one, no. But have you reached out to Class League? I and haven't. Has, yeah. I, I kind of got the, you know, you really can't have it all in this one. Okay. I just, and I know people start looking for work around this. But, and, and that was going to fix some of our solution. I had to pull it back because I had teachers that were into two more apps with data inside yeah. them that really didn't need to be there for that one particular instance that they needed. I feel like with the newer rules, they have some, uh, uh, what do they call them? There's, it's a, it's a set where you can say and or, yeah. and you would choose in that case uh, this app and no other app. Yeah. That may have. I have to look and see, but that's what I'm really looking for. Yeah. I mean, the roster works great. It does everything we need. The fact that it's standardized, all these companies just jump right in. Yes. Um, we're going to wrestle with the, uh, with the one thing next. We're going to pull that together. Yeah. Are you going to do uh, Azure? Are you going to do Google? We're both? We're, we're AD and Google. Okay. And we're, I forgot where our HR uses, but that's going to play also. Oh, very good. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Anything else? Yes. Yeah, so when you're onboarding a new technology for your students, mm -hmm. it's like one of the first questions you ask them if they've worked with the class link before, or like if their technology is like, uh, compatible with the class link to begin, or do you go to a class link and say, hey, have you worked with like, this method before? I've done, a, I actually do both ways. I'll go to class and I'll say, we're thinking of signing on with a, uh, abc.com. Do you guys work with them? And then I'll also go to that vendor and I'll say, by the way, we use ClassLink. I'm preferring to use them to roster. Um, I do have a relationship with them. So I, j because I know, I want to hear from both people. I go to both sides simultaneously. And uh, usually one of them will say yes, and then we can make it work. I've, I've never had a point where 
Like, no, you have to do it our way. Renaissance Learning with their Star 360 did want to do it their way and charge us an extra like three grand. But I said, ClassLink is telling me they have other districts using your tool, and I don't know if they're paying the three grand or not, but can I do it? And as soon as I said that, they were like, oh, okay, yes, we can do a custom solution for you. So there are some vendors that will just by default say, oh, it'll be you know a couple grand. We're going to work with you and do a custom data set. But I'm like, no, we already have ClassLink to do that. Can't you just pull from that? So there's been some situations, Renaissance Learning being one of them, where it was good that I was able to get the response from ClassLink as well. And they, they kind of advocate for you on that side, saying don't pay them. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to get there. They may not go on a regular routine, but they accept the data, the same data as ClassLink pushes. Right. Yeah, they're reluctant to do it. Yeah. But we, we've got all the information right here. Yeah. Especially when you're doing it as a uh, as a possible customer and you tell them, I'm kind of, I'm not willing to work with you guys unless I know you work with ClassLink. That really does, you know, tip over to your the favor on your side a bit. Sometimes you have to check too because sometimes it does things in the system you're putting it in mm -hmm. that you didn't necessarily want to. So that same situation, that I, that's how I came across Oh, it, okay. Is I rostered individual people that weren't in our SIS. I could mainly say, add this person in, add them to this course mm -hmm. in class. And they go in, and now they're in all the other courses, or they're in a section of the class where you really don't want them. And so, yeah. there's situations where you've got to reach out to class and say, hey, how have you done this with other people before with this one? Yeah. And companies sometimes aren't as good as class. Classlink is more they granular. Just rolled out the tool. They're not sure themselves. They haven't seen it, but Classlink has seen it. Right, right. And what I tend to do in that case is I'll make a screencast for Classlink showing the issue that I'm having, and that usually they can spot based on watching that, you know, a response right away. Yeah, yeah. They're growing all the time. Sometimes I hear people that I didn't even know that you know that just started working there, and it's they've been around for over 20 years. Oh, okay. Classlink. Yeah. And my and director said, how long will it take to set up? Take it two or three weeks. Yeah. And he said, by the time you get home, it's good. Yeah. So, they do this type of thing all the time. This is this is their wheelhouse. And, yeah. yeah. And the two people who are down on the floor right there are yeah. now the COO and the C CEO mm -hmm. at Classic. They moved up there. They yes. Yep. Yeah. So. In fact, after this session, I'm headed over. They have a user group meeting yeah. for... Uh, yeah, um, I actually I texted him because it said uh, F, which would be in this area here. I saw a Bevan kept popping out and waving high, so they may still be in the Hyatt here, but wherever it is, I, lunch is involved in there too. So I'm right, headed there next. <laughs> yeah, uh, but I'm hosting one of the sessions there too, um, the, one of the roundtables that they have. Uh, but that's running between I think now and three o'clock. Yep. Yeah. Um, anything else for the good of the group? All right. Thank you for joining, guys, Thank and uh, have a wonderful rest of Dice Game. You too.